Today we're in Matthew chapter 5. We're going to be looking at verse 6. Let me read verse 6, get into our introduction, and uh, look at this passage. Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. Jesus says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Hunger and thirst. If Marie and I, my wife and I, are talking about going out to eat, you know, we're going to go grab something to eat. We always have the same basic conversation, always. And I'm, I'm sure that you married couples here, perhaps even dating couples, might have the same kind of conversation, and it's always something like this. Marie will say, would you like to go and get something to eat? And I'll say, yeah, that, that, yeah okay. And she'll say to me, what do you want to eat? Right? What do you want to eat? Oh, I don't know, uh, maybe some spaghetti? Then she'll kind of look down. <laughs> well, maybe a burger? <laughs> and I'll go through whatever, because I, I really don't care. You put it on a plate and it doesn't move off the plate, I'll eat it. So I don't really have, you know, it doesn't matter to me most of the time. But eventually I'll get to something that she wanted and she'll go, oh, that's a great idea. I th I'm glad you thought of that. <laughs> she was just waiting for me to get there, right? But the question is always asked, what are you hungry for? What are you hungry for? And that's a great question and that's what the Lord here is giving to us when he's, he's making a statement related to hungers and thirsts. What are you hungry for? Just what is it that you want? And here's another question that can go along with that. Once you have what you have asked for, are you satisfied with it? Is it something that makes you happy? Well, the Lord is speaking concerning those things in what is called the Beatitudes. When you look at this, this uh, passage of Scripture from chapters 5, 6, and 7, what you're looking at is what is called the Sermon on the Mount. And every sermon has an introduction. So the introduction to the Sermon on the Mount is what is called the Beatitudes, or the blessings. And the Lord Jesus Christ here, as he's speaking concerning be Beatitudes, or blessings, is actually giving to us two things. He's giving to us steps to coming to faith in him, but he's also giving us the application in terms of what somebody who has come to him is actually going to be like. And so when you have steps to come into faith in Christ, while well, he speaks concerning being poor in spirit, mourning, and being meek, these are all elements that are actually uh, signifying that somebody has begun by saying, I'm spiritually impoverished, I have nothing to offer God. And then you come to realize that, that because you have nothing to offer God and you, have, and you have sinned, which has made a separation between you and God, you mourn over that. And then as you mourn over that, then you have a meekness. And all of that is associated with, with your steps to coming to faith in Christ, as well as how you're going to live, what you're going to be like after you've come to Christ. So what Jesus is speaking about here in this particular verse is really the driving passion of a person's life. After they've realized their poverty of spirit, after they have mourned, and after they have realized the meekness, he now is saying, what is your driving passion? We had a beginning, our beginning was hungering and thirsting. But he speaks of our beginning to hunger and thirst for the right thing. He's saying it's time for you to hunger and thirst after righteousness. So the deepest desire of a follower of Jesus Christ should be hunger and thirst, but a hunger and a thirst for righteousness. Now we know that there are certain physical needs that are necessary for us uh, to have met or else we're not going to survive. And these needs um, need to be met or we will die. The greatest need that we have really is you know, on a physical plane, would be air. I don't know how, how long you can hold your breath. You know, maybe somebody in here can hold their breath for a long time. I don't know. And some people got in a habit of holding their breath when they were real little. They would hold their breath when they were mad or didn't get what they wanted. We used to talk about that. They hold their breath until their, their, their face turns blue. You know, my, my wife, Marie, I don't think she'd mind me sharing with you that as she was a little girl baby, as she was a baby, when she'd get angry, she would hold her breath until her face literally got blue. Those are things she still does now. <laughs> she, would hold, she would hold her breath 
until her face got blue. And her mama would get really concerned for her because she thought the baby could die. She's not breathing. And her mom took uh, the baby, took Marie when she was a baby, to the doctor and said, my little girl, when she gets mad, holds her breath and her face turns blue and I don't know what to do. And the doctor said there's two things. One, he said, just let her pass out. Because if she passes out, she'll begin breathing automatically. Or two, he said, dip your hand in some water and just sprinkle the water on her face. And it'll cause her to, to grab her breath. And that's true, it works. <laughs> to this day. I want that purse. <laughs> So how long can you hold your breath? The average person can hold their breath up to, and this seems extreme, but I actually went to the almighty Google and they said it, <laughs> three minutes, up to three minutes. Me, I can hold my breath maybe for a minute or so. But the average person, they say, can hold their breath up to, up to around three minutes Then they need to breathe. You know what the world record for holding your breath is? 22 minutes. Yeah. Think about that. 22 minutes. Stig Severinsen set the record. 22 minutes. But guess what? In 22 minutes, one second, he better breathe because you got to breathe. And so the longest that somebody has ever held their breath that we've recorded in history is 22 minutes, but they have to breathe. That's the number one need that you have. It's the number one drive is to breathe. That's why the waterboarding and all of that is so, it, 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 it works because you need to breathe. It's just the number one thing. But you also need to, uh, to drink water. Do you know how long a person can go without water and survive under just optimum conditions? Around seven days. Under heat conditions and things that are, are very severe, much less, but up to seven days. How long can a person go without eating and survive? Well, anywhere from 21 to 40 days. At the end of 40 days is when you're famished and you will starve yourself to death at 40 days. And so, Jesus is speaking about drives, natural needs, things that we have to have to survive. And so, if you have realized that you're poor in spirit and you've come to faith in Christ, you're a beggar with your hand reaching out as you're crouching in a corner, and saying, God, be merciful to me, and, and, and you've realized you've sinned against God and it's created the meekness of spirit within you, then you're going to have a drive to do that which is pleasing to him and a hunger that is going to be quenched only in him, and that's what he's speaking about here. So he's pronouncing a blessing on those who hunger and thirst. Hunger and thirst are natural drives, but because they're natural drives, he still invests them with at least a picture as, uh, as, of a, a spirituality, if you will. He's He's, he's taking what is natural, and he speaks of the spiritual. So Jesus would often do that. Uh, on one occasion, for example, he was in, a, uh, in, in the city of Capernaum. And while he was in Capernaum, he began to speak to these people who were, who were arriving to listen to him. And, and he, he made a statement. It's found in, in John 6, verse 48, when he said to them, I am the bread of life. So we're speaking to them concerning hunger. You have a hunger for bread. Well, if you want to be satisfied in a spiritual sense, I'll first speak concerning that which is natural. You have a hunger for bread, but you need to know that I am, Jesus was saying, the bread of life. He went on in verse 54 of John 6 to say, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up at the last day. So he would speak about a natural drive that we have, something that we have a need of, and he invested it with spiritual meaning. He was speaking to a woman at the well there in a place called Samaria, the well of Sychar. And when the woman came, she was thirsty and all, and Jesus began to speak to her. She was drawing water from a well. And Jesus said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. You drink of the natural water, you will thirst again. You may be able to go three, four, five, seven days, but you will thirst again because natural water can only meet a natural need. But he's saying, but if you come to me, I will give you living water and you will never thirst again because you'll be satisfied. So hunger and thirst. Jesus is using that 
to illustrate our desires, our drives, our passions, and especially our ambition. So he's saying to hunger and thirst for righteousness is a proper ambition. Again, there are things necessary for a natural life, and there are things needed for spiritual. Hungering and thirsting for righteousness is a spiritual necessity for every believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, a starving or thirsty person has one ambition, and that is to eat, or that is to drink. Again, going back to the illustration of air, I wonder if anybody in this room has ever gotten to the point where you almost suffocated. Anybody here almost suffocate? Raise your hand if you have. Yeah, That's, it, 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 it creates panic in you. I've almost suffocated more than once. It, it creates a panic in you. I was a little boy, I was playing in the backyard. There was a big emphasis at that time of space exploration, it was in the 50s. And I wanted to be a space explorer. I was around six years old. And my mom had gone to the store and had bought some oranges. The oranges come in a plastic bag. And plastic bags make great space helmets. So I took it and I put it over my head and I was playing in the backyard and I was playing space explorer. But anybody in this room knows that if you begin to breathe in the plastic bag over your head, eventually it just clings to your face, which it did. And so I still remember that bag clinging to my face and stopping me from breathing. And now I couldn't get that bag off of my head. So I started trying to rip the bag off, but I was a little boy. I didn't have the strength to be able to peel it off my face. And I began to spin in a circle trying to pull this thing off. And my body went into panic mode because I couldn't breathe. And now my face, I know, is turning blue because I can't breathe. My mom's in the kitchen looking out to make sure I'm okay. And she thinks, what a great actor my son is. <laughs> he's acting like he's suffocating because she could see me pulling at my face. I still remember my mom, I remember the screen door of that back, uh, the back of the house, the back door. I remember it swinging open and my mother running and actually leaping over a planter, hitting the grass in full speed, jumping on me and grabbing that bag off and dragging it off my head. I know what it feels like to almost suffocate and to need to be rescued. And the Lord is saying there needs to be within you, if you're saved, this drive the kind of drive that you would have if you were not able to breathe, the kind of drive that you would have if you hadn't eaten, the kind of drive that you would have, that ambition that you would have if you had no water, this great desire to be able to fulfill that need. And he's saying that need is met in me. So blessed are you when you hunger and you thirst after righteousness. You see, the natural man is not ambitious for the things that please God. So what Jesus is really doing here is he's, he's contrasting man's natural drive for pleasure with the drive for that which is spiritual. You see, the Bible teaches that by nature, by human nature, we are ambitious to satisfy selfish desires. In Romans 8, verse 5, it says it like this, those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things, but those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. And so... When you have a natural desire, a natural inclination, the Bible teaches that you're going to pursue that with all of your heart. But that natural inclination will not spiritually satisfy you. In Romans chapter 8, verse 7, the sinful mind is hostile to God. It doesn't submit to God's law, nor can it do so. So that kind of hunger produces in society what we would call moral chaos, a society that is really unrighteous because it pursues the wrong thing. And the moral chaos that we have in our society today is a direct result of hungering and thirsting for the wrong kinds of things, thinking that those things are going to satisfy us forever. You see, there's one sad fact about hungering and thirsting for the wrong things, and that is this. You usually end up getting them, and they just don't satisfy. Spiritual hunger cannot be satisfied by material things. Somebody once said, I have heard of hungry travelers who were lost in the wilderness and came upon a bag which they hoped might yield them a supply of food. They eagerly opened the bag, but it contained nothing but pearls, which they poured out contemptuously upon the desert sand. 
Even so, when a man is hungry and thirsting after things of this life, and all his thoughts are taken up with carnal appetites, he will reject as worthless the priceless promises of God. Well, that's true, and because it is true, God has a question that he would want us to be able to answer. The question is found in Isaiah 55, verse 2. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Without a primary desire for God, the hunger that you have will never be satisfied. That kind of hunger can only be satisfied by a saving knowledge and a growing knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody said, to be hungry is not enough. I must be really starving to know what is in God's heart toward me. When the prodigal son was hungry, he went to feed on the husks. But when he was starving, he turned to his father. And that's what the Lord is simply saying. It's so basic. All of us know this already. He's saying this, only God can satisfy your hunger. That's why he said in John 6, 35, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes on me shall never thirst. So Jesus is saying it. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. You see, he's already made it clear that you need to realize your poverty. He's made it clear that as a result of that, you mourn. The result of that will be meekness. Now, as a believer following him, you're going to seek what is best. You're going to begin to hunger and thirst after righteousness because you need his righteousness to replace your sin. And he's made this possible for us. It's not by works of righteousness which we've done. According to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration, the renewing of the Holy Spirit. It isn't by works that we're saved. It's by God's grace through faith. We haven't done it for ourselves. He did it on our behalf. And, and in this reception of what Christ did, when you by faith put your trust in him, your whole life changes. And he actually gives to you something that you didn't have before. You see, before we are, the scripture says, we're, we're unrighteous. We have no righteousness. We're unrighteous. But according to 2 Corinthians 5.21, he, God, made him, Jesus, he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And so when you committed your heart to Christ, God gave you what you don't have. It's called imputed righteousness. He gave you what you don't have. He gave you righteousness. All my righteousness was as filthy rags. So what God gave to me was his righteousness. And now I hunger for him. Now, when we first begin to hunger and thirst for righteousness, that's the step towards salvation. Righteousness, when he speaks concerning righteousness, can be used to speak of, of, of salvation, of being saved. Like it says in Romans 10, 9, and 10, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. So when you stop trying to save yourself and you give yourself over to the Lord and are saved by Jesus Christ, he's saying you will be blessed. Happy are you, blessed are you when that occurs. But after you've been saved, the desire for righteousness is not only something you had at the beginning, but it begins to be the continuing passion of your life. And it's a growing hunger. Here's something for you. It's very practical, and hopefully we'll all be able to take this moment to consider what I'm about to say. This is one of those ways that you can take a spiritual inventory. Just a basic question, but it's something worthy of consideration. Here's the question. Do you have a consuming passion for God? Or is, is this, this relationship with God really not that important? Or is it a curiosity of some sort to you? Has it become a consuming passion? Is it the kind of passion that you would have if you were suffocating? Is it the kind of passion that you would have as one suffocating to have air? Or if you're starving, to have a meal? Or if you're thirsty, to have water to quench your thirst? Because, listen, the Lord is saying that the mark of a believer, and this is what sometimes people have such trouble with because we... In many ways, we want to kind of lighten the, uh, 
the reality of what it means to be a disciple of Christ. We want to kind of, we want to lower the bar of what that really is and, and all. But fact is, is that's just normal Christianity. What is, your, what is your passion? What is it that you love the most? If somebody were to, to interview uh, somebody who knows you best, if you're a parent, maybe a wife or a child or husband or, uh, you know, maybe somebody can speak to your best friend or speak to your parents and say, listen, I want to ask you a question. Can you tell me what is it in uh, this person's life that is their master passion, the driving interest? the thing that is most important to them. What is it really? Well, before somebody does that, maybe we ought to do that for ourselves. What is my master passion? What is the overriding concern for me? Somebody says, well, that's the problem with you Christians. You make it so serious. Well, indeed it is. To be a follower of Christ, indeed it is. As a matter of fact, it's a life. It's a way of life. It's a transformed life. It, it, it's a life that actually have passions that, that are centered on something that is greater than the here and the now. It, it's, it's what I will give my time to. It's what I give my talent to. It's what I give my, my tithe to. It's, it's what I want the most in my life. There are some whose master passion is, is to have a relationship with somebody to be married and perhaps have children with them, and that's their master passion. There are others who would love to have a better home or a greater education or, or a better, uh, better financial uh, situation. All of that is part of life. There's nothing wrong with wanting to, to be educated. There's nothing wrong with wanting to have a, a husband or a wife and, 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 and have a family. There's nothing wrong with that, of course. I mean, the Lord has placed within us a desire for those kinds of things. There's nothing wrong with that. But the thing that becomes wrong is when that becomes the driving force of my life. When that's all I really want, and I can't think of anything else but that. Well, at that point, uh, something has taken the throne where the Lord God should be seated. Something else has. So the Lord is simply saying here, listen, if you recognize the poverty of spirit, if you've recognized uh, that to the degree that you've mourned over it and humility have taken uh, residence within you, then you're going to have a master passion which will be to make sure that I'm first in your life, to, to pursue me with all that you have within you. I've had people ask me this simple question. I don't want this to be a message about me and all, but at the same time, this is something I've been asked. They've said, listen, you've been walking with the Lord for 44 years. How'd that happen? How did you remain faithful for 44 years? Because there's a lot of people, I have to tell you, that I've encountered over the years who who have gone forward in an invitation who never went forward in their walk with the Lord. There's a lot of people who, who say, oh yeah, I was a Christian for a while, then I, then I discovered Confucianism, and then I discovered um, Buddhism, and then I discovered Islam. You know, They move from one thing to another to another, and it's all the same in their mind. But is that, is that true? Is that the fact? And the fact is, is, no, that isn't true. What is your master passion? See, when I got saved, I didn't say, now that I have Jesus, I wonder what, what Muhammad has to say. I didn't do that. I can still remember when I was first saved. I, w I wasn't more than two weeks old in the Lord, three weeks at the max. And I had some guy come to a friend of mine's house. He was doing some work on the house. And, and as he came to the house, I, you know, I was told, you ought to share your faith with people. And I was a brand new believer and very curious and all. And so I, I remember speaking to this guy who had come to do some work. And I asked him, you know, do you believe in Christ? And he said, oh, yes, I do. I said, oh, wonderful, you're a Christian? He says, no. He says, I'm with the Self-Realization Fellowship. And I said, I've never heard that. And I'm a brand new Christian. I'm 20 years old. I've never heard of what is a Self-Realization Fellowship. What is that? So I said, what is that? And he says, oh, we believe the truth of, that has come to us from all the great teachers who have ever lived. I said, all the great teachers? He says, oh, yes. And he gives me a list of teachers, Muhammad and, and Buddha, Confucius, a variety of them. We believe all of the things that they said. I said, you believe all of that? Now, listen, I'm a brand new Christian, and now I'm confused. Now I'm confused. And I've always been curious. I mean, if I'm going to commit myself to something, I want to know what it is I committed myself to. And now you're saying that you can be a, a committed person to all of these different trains of thought, schools of thought. I'm a brand new Christian, but I know a scripture. So I say to him, listen, let me ask you a question. I said, do you believe what Jesus said? 
And he says, oh, absolutely, everything he said, we believe. I said, in the self-realization fellowship, you believe everything Jesus said? He said, yes. I said, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Do you believe that? Yes, I do. You believe that? Now I'm really confused. So I said to him, if Jesus said he's the exclusive way to God, how can you believe that, that, that Muhammad will bring you into the presence of God? And how can you believe that you can be a Buddhist? He says, I don't want to argue. I said, I'm not, I'm not arguing. I'm confused. And I was serious. I'm confused. How can you say that Jesus Christ, who said the only way to God is him, and you believe him, how is it that you do not really believe him, and yet you say you believe him? And so he said, I have to finish my work. I, won't, I don't want to argue with you. But I, and he never answered the question, because it didn't make sense to me, and it still doesn't. Either you are in or you are out. You know, ladies, you can't be kind of pregnant. <laughs> sorta. I'm sorta pregnant. Oh, really? How's that work? That you're sorta. Either you are or you're not. Right? I mean, come on. Either you are or you're not. Either you're committed to Christ or you're not. Either you're hot or you're cold. But you can't be both. Either you gather or you scatter. But you don't do both. So which is it? Is Jesus Christ really the Lord, or is he somebody that you admire? Is he somebody that you love and you listen to what he has to say, or is it somebody that you tolerate on occasion? Seasonally. It's Easter, we go to church. It's Christmas, we go to church. It's a wedding, we go to church. It's a baptism, we go to church. That's what we do. And we prioritize our lives around those things. Again, there's nothing wrong with enjoying life. God, God made life in such a beautiful way that we do enjoy it. But I also see that within the enjoyment of life that I can sometimes have the wrong priorities. You know, I watched a, a bit of a football game last week. There was a football game on. Some of you might have noted it. And I think the, la the, the play at the, at the end of the game was amazingly stupid. Okay, I said it. I wouldn't have thrown a pass on a two-yard line. But they didn't call me and ask. <laughs> I mean, you got this, this huge beast. Anyway, I mean, I, and I didn't care. I didn't have a dog in the fight. I didn't have a horse in the race. It didn't matter to me either way. But I, I, I found it fascinating, and I found the halftime fascinating with this huge lion and some woman who's saying, watch me roar, roar, and oh, boy, that was entertaining. She's real proud of kissing a girl and liking it, too. <laughs> anyway, I had to get to the point. The point I was going to make, <laughs> of great interest to me, is, is this old man up there saying he doesn't like the Super Bowl? How can you blaspheme against the Holy Super Bowl? No, I'm not saying that. Listen, I've watched Super Bowls since, uh, since the Jets beat uh, the, the Colts. I mean, we're talking ancient history. Okay, I remember that. So it's, but it's never been a big thing. And at that time, it was a football game. Now it's like the start of the Olympics. It's an entirely different thing. You have to have all of this weird stuff. What's really interesting is I was reading in the sports page that they were selling the cheapest seats for $10,000. Yeah, did you read that? Anybody read that? $10,000. $10,000. Wow, that's the cheap seats. The more expensive ones were over $400,000. Yeah, think about that for a minute. Now, we're talking priorities and hungers. And, 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 and somebody's going to say, oh, that's a problem with you old men out there. You know, Okay, listen carefully. All I'm saying is this. If I had $400,000 plus, thousand dollars, hmm, what can I do with that? I think I'll see a football game. I don't think so. So this is kind of where we're at. We are willing to put our money where our heart is, our activity where our heart is. And the funny thing about this is I promise you, I mentioned to you that I've been aware of Super Bowls for many years. I can only tell you that the Rams won a while back now. We call them the Lambs, but the Rams won a while back. 
And that's pretty much the only interest I ever had other than to watch the Jets beat the Colts because, because Namath had predicted that they would and I thought that was interesting. So I thought, let's see what they do. Hey, they did. Wow, didn't change my life. I'm not a better man for it. It's just what happened. And I saw it. So America has a tendency of worshiping the wrong things and investing in the wrong things. I was in the Philippines years ago now. I was walking into a, a McDonald's, some home cooking. I was walking into a McDonald's. And as we were walking into the McDonald's, there was a man, an armed guard with an M16 standing at the door. And uh, I guess he wanted to keep the customers in there, I don't know, but he was standing there with the door, at the door with an M16. There was a little girl, I'd say less than 10, who was standing outside as we began to walk in and there were gates that you had to actually go in to get through. It was in a pretty rough area of town, obviously. And this little girl was standing at the gate as we began to walk in, she had her little hand out like this because she was hungry. And so we gave her some money so she could buy some food. And she went in and was able to eat. And that stuck in the back of my mind when I went to my room, the little hotel that we were staying in, and I turned on the TV set because I wanted to see what was being broadcast there in the Philippines. And there was a commercial for cat food with this beautiful white Persian not a white, per a white cat, I don't know what it was, it was, real, it was one of those very fluffy cats, um, whatever, but it was big, and it was eating cat food out of crystal. This, it was an American commercial with a cat eating cat food out of crystal, a crystal dish, I'll never forget that, and I had just come from a McDonald's where a little girl had her hand out so she get a, could get a, a, a hamburger, and I, I couldn't help but think, no wonder so many people hate Americans. No wonder. Because we, we have our commercials in a poverty-stricken nation where cats eat out of crystals and little girls stick their hands out at McDonald's. And see, that changed my life in the way that I began to think, what am I hungering for and what am I thirsting for? Really. When you hunger and thirst after the things of the Lord, your life changes. When you don't, it stays the same. You will argue about it. it's okay, you know. And again, I'm not arguing with anybody, over it, but people will argue it's okay to spend four hundred and eighty thousand dollars for a ticket for a football game if you got the money. Why not? Well, probably because I could think of a lot of other things to do with four hundred plus thousand dollars, and it doesn't include going to sit down for a game that I'm going to forget in three years. Doesn't matter, does it? Because over time, those things all diminish. And what we have is what is called the law of diminishing returns. What you have excitedly partaken of today is going to need to be increased tomorrow or else it's boring. And that's what happened. And this nation that I love with all of my heart served in the military to protect and defend. This nation, this nation is going in the wrong direction. But the world is too. And that's why Jesus says, blessed are you if you hunger and thirst after righteousness you shall be filled. You will be satisfied. The word satisfied, you'll be satisfied, you'll be filled. That word really was used in reference to when you fed your animals. The animal would come and you would feed the animal until the animal turned away because they were satisfied. And Jesus is saying, in the Lord is your only source of complete satisfaction. You'll be completely full when you seek him first. You'll be completely full when you hunger and thirst for him. It's like what it says in Jeremiah 31, 14, I will satisfy the priest with abundance and my people will be satisfied with my goodness. So our part is to, to seek. His part is to satisfy. You know, when we eat something that we truly enjoy, though we become full, we're still going to want some more later on. Marie makes her, my favorite meal that she makes, and I haven't had this for a while. She's listening right now. <laughs> is her, her chili rellenos. They are so, so good. And she'll make them for me. Oh, and I want more. I want more. Marie. I want more. 
they're, they're so good. When you taste and see that the Lord is good, you want more. So people will say, oh, you Jesus freaks, oh, you guys are so fanatical. I don't know if I'm fanatical for being in love with the Lord. Because when you're in love with the Lord of love, he teaches you to love others who are not lovely or lovable. Our faith teaches us to pray for those who despitefully use us, for those who persecute us. Our faith tells us that our God sent his son to die for us. Not that I should send my son to die for him in the way that Islam teaches. And when you have a relationship with the Lord, it is like, I have him, but I want more of him. And even though I have a sense of abundance in him, not the things he can give me or the things he does for me. I'm talking about him. See, marriage, for example, marriage isn't just having a, a ring on your finger and having a license that says you're married, and it's not even the event of the wedding. It's that person. That's the person I want to be with, and the more I know this person, the more I want to know this person, and I want to spend the rest of my life with just this one person as my wife or a woman may say, a husband. When I am satisfied with my wife, my eyes don't look to other women. Why would I? When I have everything I want, and not only do I have what I want, I want more of that person I'm with. I want, I'm satisfied. Well, in your relationship with God, yes, he's saved me, and yes, he's blessed me today, but guess what? Tomorrow, he's going to do it again, and it's even going to be richer. It's even going to be deeper. It's going to be so satisfying. Why? Because he said, if you hunger and thirst after righteousness, you will be filled. And he will fill you with his presence and fill you with his presence and fill you with his presence. So I can drink of the water of the world and thirst again. I can eat of that which is produced in this world and hunger again. Or I can grow to be satisfied and continue to be satisfied in him. It's like what it says in Isaiah 26, verse 9, all night long I search for you, earnestly I seek for God. That's Christianity. Anything less than that isn't really what we should have. What we want is more of him. Lord, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you as in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. I want more of you. That should be the prayer of every Christian.